help us to take comfort in our baptism and the, the promises to it, that you attach to it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hello, hello. Hey, Michelle. Come on in. So we are on chapter seven. We'll be starting today. Any questions from last time? Anything carried over? Okay. So last time we looked at uh, creation, uh, God giving us the, the gift of the world, um, creating man and woman uh, as the crown of his creation. Uh, and then we, we started into chapter eight, but um, um, chapter eight is one that's really easy to break up. Chapter seven isn't so much. So I wanted to be able to start seven at the beginning. So let's, let's start with chapter seven here. Um, in chapter four, we looked at how the Holy Spirit gives us the gift of faith. When someone believes, it's because the Holy Spirit has been working in them. He's used the word. Uh, and we'll also talk about today how he uses the sacraments um, to, to do his work. Uh, so those two go together. You know, the Holy Spirit does the work. Uh, in chapter five, we looked at the church, one of the, the tools that he uses to benefit us, to, to connect us with his word. Um, and then in chapter seven, we're going to be looking at the sacraments. Uh, the word sacrament uh, simply, I mean, it basically means a sacred act. So we use it to refer to specific sacred acts. Um, so there's kind of the broad term and, and the narrow definitions. And different groups have different definitions for what a sacrament is. So like, for example, uh, um, the, the Catholic Church has seven sacraments. Uh, we talk about two sacraments. Um, but when we talk about the sacraments, we have very specific a very specific definition we're talking about. So uh, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit. But we start by, by reminding ourselves that um, God works uh, through the gospel, right? And the gospel comes to us in two forms. First, is the power of God for salvation. He uses the good news of what Jesus has done to change hearts, to cause faith in him. Um, so then we also talk about the, the gospel coming to us in the sacrament. Sometimes we talk about the visible gospel, where we can see it. Um, and to understand when, when we're talking about this, this isn't necessarily a separate thing, because the only things that the only thing that makes the sacraments sacraments that makes them powerful is that God's word is attached to it. It's not just water in baptism. It's God's word that makes that water do something. It's not just bread and wine in the Lord's Supper. It's God's word. So, so these two aren't really separate things, right? So the gospel through the spoken word and then also the gospel in the sacrament. And so when we, when we define a sacrament, we are talking about something that fits all three of these criteria. It's a sacred act instituted by Christ. So God told us to do it. Uh, it has a visible element connected with God's word. So it's something that we are physically participating in. Um, and then it, it offers. talk about the definition, uh, maybe, you know, compare it, like I said, the Catholic Church teaches seven sacraments. Well, if they're looking at a different way of defining it, okay, because, you know, they include things like marriage on there. And you say, okay, marriage, did God tell us to do it? Yeah, Jesus said, do it, good thing. So it fits that first one. Uh, visible element connected with God's word? Well, I suppose if you want to say the ring, maybe, or the people, uh, that might be a stretch. Uh, but okay, so maybe, but then nowhere does the Bible say that marriage gives forgiveness of sins. Um, so that's why it doesn't fit our criteria or, or like the, the Catholic church has, um, ordination as a, a sacrament. Um, okay, well, let's, let's put it up against our criteria here. Did God say do it? Absolutely. Um, you know, talked about, uh, uh, laying the hands on the elders and setting people apart for specific jobs, absolutely. Um, 
visible element connected with God's word? Not, not really. Maybe if you want to say the laying on of hands, that's something visible, but but still that's kind of a stretch. Um, but nowhere does the Bible say that ordination gives forgiveness of sins. God doesn't say that he forgives our sins through it. He uses it, and it's a good thing. So there's a lot of good things God tells us to do. But when we're talking about sacraments, we we narrow it down to those two that fit all three of those criteria. Does that make sense? Any questions on that? The intro to the sacraments, the rest of the lesson then is divided into the two sacraments. The first one we'll talk about is baptism. Um, you've probably seen a baptism, if not in person, certainly in the movies, right? The, the water and the word, and it's a, it's a, it's a special thing. Um, but we start by looking at what is the meaning of that word baptism? What, uh, what, is, what is going on uh, physically? Uh, the word itself, baptizo in the Greek, uh, is a very broad word that is used in a lot of different ways. And it, it, its basic meaning is you use water, you wash with water. And that washing can be done in a lot of different ways. It can be sprinkling, it can be pouring, it can be, you know, dunking it under. Um, but somewhere or another, you're making something clean with, with water. That's, that's the word itself. Um, I, I put on there a passage from Mark that... hands before you eat he was kind of ahead of his time but he he wanted them to be different he wanted them you know to do this this washing there were ceremonial washings in judaism um but then the pharisees kind of took that and and added to it and they they had all of these different washings you know when when you enter the house you wash this and then you, you when you start the meal before the prayer you you wash and then uh when this happens you wash again and when that and, and it was all these washings so they had gotten to the point according to Josephus, the historian, that that uh, one of these washings consisted of hitting three drops on each elbow, and that would be considered a, a washing. Um, point is, uh, it, it wasn't, there are a lot of different ways that that word is, is used. Um, and so the reason I bring this up is because there are some who want to say, well, baptism has to be, you know, God said it has to be done in a certain way, whether that's, you know, by immersing. It's not a baptism unless it goes all the way under. Well, that's not what the word says. Um, or by pouring or by sprinkling. Um, when God says baptize, he is saying use water. Um, so is sprinkling a baptism? Yes. Pouring a baptism? Yes. Immersing? Yes. Uh, so anyone who, so you know, the people who would say, no, it's only if you're immersed, we'd have to say, no, God, God doesn't say that. We don't want to make rules where, where he doesn't. Um, and in fact, a lot of times that comes from uh, an emphasis on baptism that is more about what I'm doing than about what God's doing. So when we talk about that, that's something I should have said about the sacraments. When we talk about the sacraments, they're always an arrow down thing. When, when you think about um, what God, when, when God describes these things, um, there are a lot of things God tells us that are arrow up. We're doing something for God. When he talks about baptism in the Lord's Supper, it's not. He, he's talking about what he's doing for us. And so the, uh, um, the 
a lot of times the the misunderstanding of how it's got to be one way or the other comes from also misunderstanding the purpose of baptism but we'll get into the purpose next first of all though any questions about immersion pouring sprinkling uh you know sometimes the argument is made well jesus was immersed when he was baptized um and my response is always all right pastor you keep going mute and i can't hear like every other word I oh. I okay. you, whether it was my computer or you but the main screen just okay. keeps for like 30 seconds at a time oh and i'm yeah, sorry mine's cutting out you like freeze but you're a little your smaller picture is fine but you have that one on you okay so what i will do then is i will mute the big speaker which will mean it'll be, it'll be harder for you to hear the other people in here Okay, how about now? Is this better? Um, okay. How about now? Can you hear me now? I can hear you. I mean, it, every 30, it's like 30 seconds, I can, you freeze up, and then 30 seconds, you're good, and then 30 seconds, it freezes. Okay. I thought it computer so i joined with my work laptop that has a better internet but it was the same thing okay so i, I switched off just my laptop which is the smaller screen so let me know if it happens again i apologize no worries okay all right so let's see where is that echo coming from okay pastor i have a question yes judy uh, isn't there something about being baptized in the Holy Spirit? Okay. So, yeah, so we talk about the uh, um, the power of baptism, the, the power of conversion, bringing someone to faith, uh, is the work of the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit is certainly involved in baptism. Uh, it's, it's his work that that's happening. Um, there are uses of that phrase in the early Christian church, um, in the outpouring of special gifts of the Spirit, that is sometimes called the uh, baptism in the Holy Spirit, but a lot of times there's some confusion in the way people use that. So um, in baptism, water baptism that we're talking about, the Holy Spirit works, he creates faith, and we'll look at some passages that, that show all of this. Um, there are some denominations that say then there's a separate outpouring of the Holy Spirit where he gives extra special gifts. Um, now, like on Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was given to the church in a powerful way, and they were able to speak uh, in different languages so that the different people could hear them. Uh, and I would say the Holy Spirit is still working those Pentecost miracles as he is um, you know, we, we send missionaries around the world and they learn the languages and they speak them and they uh, and, and the spirit works through their word. Uh, but we we want to be careful not to make it sound like there are different levels of Christian. There are some denominations that talk about, OK, well, there's just regular Christians, but then there's the Christians that have the Holy Spirit who can speak in tongues and do all these other things. Um, that is not according to Scripture. In fact, uh, that that uh, goes against what Scripture says about the, the Holy Spirit giving gifts to each as he sees fit and, and not, um, not having you know, these super Christians and these that aren't really fully Christian because they don't have the Holy Spirit yet. No, uh, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So if, if someone believes they have the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's working in them and producing fruit, it might not be the same kind of fruit that someone else has seen, but he's producing fruit. Uh, and I, when I answered that, I, I, I might have t made some assumptions as to what you were asking. You might have been asking something different. So I'll, I'll ask you if I hit your question, because um, there's a lot of things people mean with, th with that phrase. Did I answer your question, or do you want to clarify it? No, you answered it. Okay, good, good. <clears throat> All right. So um, with the first part here, just the... Uh, baptizing using water you know and i said uh 
I had started to talk about uh, Jesus, that some people say, well, he was immersed, so we should be immersed. The Bible doesn't say he was immersed. Uh, it says he came up out of the water, uh, which is how they talk about anyone walking out of the river. You know, if, if, if uh, you know, when, when the people of Israel crossed the Jordan River, they came up out of the river, uh, even though they hadn't gotten wet at all. Um, Jesus, he could have been standing in, you know, two feet of water and, and water sprinkled over his head. I don't know. My, my thought is he probably was immersed, but the Bible doesn't say that he was. Um, it says that he went down into the river, John baptized him, and then he came up out of the river. Um, and we have examples of baptisms in the New Testament that would be really difficult to, uh, um, describe, to, to think that they were immersion, like the jailer at Philippi in the middle of the night, or um, like there's another passage that talks about some of the ceremonial washings, those baptisms of couches, uh, and I, I'm certain that they weren't dunking their couches in, in uh, um, before every meal uh, into some body of water. Um, so, yeah. Oh, the other thing then that I was going to bring up on immersion, um, some people say, well, there's that passage where in Romans, Paul says we were buried with Christ through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Beautiful picture of what would be an immersion, right? Baptized, under the water, brought up. Um, but then there's also passages that talk about in baptism, the Holy Spirit is poured out on us. A beautiful picture of the, of the pouring of water in baptism. And there's another one that talks about the Holy Spirit, our hearts being sprinkled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, so all three of those forms, um, you could say, well, the, the Bible says, yeah, it, uses, it hits all of them. Um, so the point of this, uh, it's not about how, it's baptized. So if someone tells you, hey, you weren't immersed, you weren't really baptized, you don't have to worry about that. God says use water. If water was used and his word, we'll get into that part next, um, you can take comfort in your baptism. So that's what the next part is. What's the purpose of baptism? How do we take comfort in it? Well, the Bible says that baptism creates or strengthens faith. Um, so if, if someone doesn't have faith, creates it. If someone is already a believer, it, it strengthens that. Uh, and I start with the passage that I most often hear quoted to defend different understandings of baptism, because it contains a couple of words that sound like some of the other teachings, but when you look at what the passage actually says, it really clearly describes what God is doing here. So um, let's read the passage, and then we will, uh, I'll, I'll kind of walk you through it. So Dale, you want that one? <clears throat> And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of good conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay, so there are, there are some churches that talk about baptism being a symbol of our commitment to God. When I get baptized, that's, that's the symbol that I'm handing my heart over to Jesus, that I'm inviting him into my heart, that I'm, uh, that I'm, coming to God, that I want to be God's child. Um, and so they, they talk about baptism being that symbol. And so they'll, they'll say, look, right here, it says that baptism is a symbol. And then I ask him to read it again. Um, what's the symbol here? Baptism is being symbolized by something, right? Water. The water. And the water that he's talking about, if you look in the verses before, he's talking about the flood, the waters of the flood. And you know, normally when we think of the flood, you know, Noah's Ark, that whole story, when, when we think of the flood, we think of the, you know, what did it do? It destroyed the world. It, it killed everybody and all the animals except what was on that ark. And we think of that destruction. But, but Peter here says, no, think about the other side of it. Think about how much the flood was a rescue. Noah and his family were the only believers left on earth. The unbelievers had successfully converted everybody except for them. And here Noah is building this ark for 120 years and people are calling him crazy. And, and I mean, you can you imagine the ridicule. Uh, God wanted to rescue his people so that they could uh, not be overwhelmed by that evil influence. And so God sent the flood. And through it, he washed the world clean. He, he started new with his family of believers. <coughs> That's where I'm hearing this. 
I'm hearing this uh, double echo and it's coming out of this thing. So let's just go like that. Okay, can you still hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, we got you. I wasn't okay. getting an echo. Okay. So it was just annoying to me then. <laughs> and it's still going. Vicar, make that stop. <laughs> Maybe put it way over there. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> um, all right. What was it? Oh, yeah. Noah. So he, he washed clean the world. Um, and he said, so this, this water of the flood that washed everything clean and rescued Noah, this water of the flood symbolizes baptism. It's not saying baptism is a symbol. It's saying the flood is a picture of baptism in that it washed everything clean to save God's people. And then he goes on. This water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. So he describes that word baptism. What does baptism do? Baptism saves you. Baptism doesn't symbolize something. It saves you. The water symbolizes baptism. Baptism saves you. And, and then he describes it, you know, not, not by removing dirt from your body. Not, you know, not because you're taking a physical bath and that somehow, um, you know, prevents disease or something. But the pledge of a good conscience toward God. And uh, there again, people see that word pledge. And I've heard that used to, de to defend. Well, see, baptism is our commitment to God. It's, it's me, you know, symbolizing my faith in God, and I'm making this pledge toward God. Um, but notice what the pledge is. The pledge is a good conscience. Or, I'm sorry, baptism is the pledge, saying that I have a good conscience, right? Because baptism saves you, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge. So it, it, it's not, it's not a, a physical washing thing. It's a pledge. And, and so maybe to understand that word pledge, I think when we hear that word, we're thinking, you know, I pledge allegiance to the flag. That's my statement of, of faith or whatever. Um, the, the word itself refers to, to something that is proof. So like in the barter system, um, let's say, Dale, I, I trade you my goat for half of next year's crops. Okay, so I give you the goat and uh, you have to give me something in pledge to prove that you owe me half of next year's crops, right? So that next year when the crops come in, I say, hey, okay, Dale, uh, uh, let me collect. And you'd be like, what crops? What goat, right? No, uh, but I could say, no, here's the, the pledge. Um, you know, maybe it's your signet ring. Maybe it's your, you know, family crest or something. I could say, see, look, and then, okay, you give it back. You know, maybe today, I think of it when I went to get my... Uh, refrigerator for our house and I, I borrowed someone's trailer and and uh, you know I wanted to save the $29 or whatever it was delivery and and so I, I drove over there and uh, I think it was more than 29 otherwise I might have just done it but uh, I, I drove over there and you know went in and picked out a refrigerator and and uh, went up to cash register and 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 paid way too much money um, and they did not give me a refrigerator I walked out of the door out of the store with no refrigerator they gave me a little piece of paper. And uh, then I took that little piece of paper. That was my pledge. That was my proof that I had paid for it. And I took that around to the loading dock. And sure enough, they gave me the refrigerator because I had that pledge. Um, and so now think, think about baptism being a pledge. I've been baptized. That's my proof. That, that, that's something physical, visible, that, that says you've got a good conscience before God. Um, your sins are forgiven, right? We'll look at that in a couple of passages where it talks about baptism, forgiving our sins. Um, so the flood symbolized baptism. Baptism saves. Baptism is a pledge. And it saves you by the resurrection of Jesus. I think that's an important statement in there. Uh, it's not the outward act or just, you know, I checked the box that I was baptized that does it. It's what it does. It connects me with what Jesus did. Does that make sense? It, it connects me to Jesus' death and resurrection for my sins. That's why baptism saves me, because of what Jesus did, not because I did the right activity in being baptized. Does that make sense? So we got the, the purpose there. Uh, Acts 2, 38 and 39. Judy, you want to read that one? Top of page 34? Uh, no, go to the next person. Okay, Mary Beth, you want that one? 
Sure. Um, Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Okay, thank you. So some context there. This is Acts 2, so that's Pentecost. If you remember, you know, Jesus died, he rose, he ascended into heaven, he promised to send the Holy Spirit. And then on Pentecost, so 50 days after he rose, um, the, the, the town is, they all hear this, this sound of a rushing wind. They, they come to find out what it is. They see the disciples with flames of fire up over their heads, and uh, they realize, hey, something big is going on here. The disciples start preaching. Peter gets up, and, and he starts talking, and he tells them, hey, um, you know, God, God sent his son, and, and there were signs. You know, he did miracles. He did all of this. Um, and, and they're, they're following along. So Jesus was the son, and then Peter, Peter hits him, and you put him to death. You killed God's son. And it said that it cut them to the heart. And they asked Peter, what should we do? And this was Peter's answer. Re repent. So instead of fighting against Jesus, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. So notice what he says baptism does, for the forgiveness of your sins. And he says, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Through baptism, the Holy Spirit enters into my heart. Um, and, he, and he says the promise is for you and your children. It's not just, hey, one day only, only you who are here. But this is something that, that gets carried on um, for all whom the Lord our God will call. And then Galatians 3. Uh, Vicar, you want that one? You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Okay. So, all... Sons of God, children of God, um, all who have baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. So in the previous passage, we heard that baptism washes our sins away. In this one, it clothes us again in Christ's righteousness, takes away the dirty rags and puts on Christ's perfection. Um, and, and it's not just a, a one time, you know, it, it helps on the day of my baptism, but, but it's a, a continuing ongoing relationship. You know, you think about, I, I usually use the picture of adoption to describe baptism because there's, um, you know, your, your children of God through him. You know, he, he brought us into his family. And when an adoption happens, there's, there's a lot of work that goes into it, a lot of paperwork, a lot of visits and inspections and all that kind of thing. And, and when you finally get to the day where you go to the courtroom and you sign the papers, and, and those children or that child is adopted to become part of the family. You are now my child. Um, and then they go to bed and wake up the next morning. What's the situation? They're still their child, right? I mean, there's still that, that ongoing relationship. And that's what uh, um, the, the Titus passage kind of brings out. Uh, you want that one, Michelle? He saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that, having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. Okay. Um, yeah, kind of walk through that one. Uh, we're saved not because we did the right things, not because we checked the right boxes, but because he loved us, his mercy. And he uses that washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. He uses baptism. And the Holy Spirit, he poured out on us so that having been justified, right, through that connection, we get that not guilty verdict. We become heirs. What's an heir? You know, they're, they're, they've got inheritance coming. Uh, we become heirs. We're in God's family, and we've got an eternal inheritance. So amazing things that are ascribed to baptism. Any, any questions there? It's definitely, you know, when the Bible talks about it, it's an arrow down thing. God is doing something for me, forgiving my sins, clothing me in Christ's righteousness, making me his child. Um, so in the next question, who is that for? Who should be baptized? Whom do we baptize? Uh, Dale, you want Matthew 28, 19? <laughs> Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Okay. 
So this was the, <laughs> the great commission. Jesus sends out his disciples. He sends us out telling us to make disciples, make followers of him. And then he tells us how, by baptizing. And the next verse he'll say by teaching. Um, and and notice, notice who? All nations. So if you read this passage and then I told you, okay, so Jesus wants us to make disciples of, of everybody except for the Eastern European nations or except for the Asian nations or except for the, the North American nations, I, I would hope you would say that's crazy. It doesn't say that it says all nations. Um, if I would say, well, yeah, yeah, but he means all nations, you know, people, uh, but not the old people. No one over, and I'm not going to say an age because I don't want to offend anyone. No one over, you know, that age, don't make disciples of them. You would say that's crazy. Um, it doesn't say that. He says all nations. But there are some who say, well, what he means by that is all nations except for children. Um, don't baptize children, just everybody else, not the children. Um, and I would hope you would say, wait a second. If that's what he meant, he, he, let's look for where he said it. Because, again, if, if I'm going to stand before God and he says, now, why were you teaching people to baptize children? My answer would be, well, because you said so. Um, and I'd, I'd much rather have that than if, he, if I were teaching don't baptize children. And he would say, why were you teaching not to baptize children? My answer would have to be, well, I didn't think you meant what you said. Um, I figured I understood it better than, than what you actually said. And I, I don't want to be in that situation. Um, so let, let's talk about this a little bit more because, you know, the, the general argument against baptizing children is they don't know what's going on. They didn't ask for it. You know, if you, if you bring an infant up to be baptized, well, they didn't ask for it. Um, you know, they didn't do anything for it. Well, if you remember, baptism is always, whether you're 40 days, 40 minutes, or 40 years old, um, baptism is always an arrow down thing. It's what God is doing for me. Um, people say, well, yeah, but, but all children are innocent. Um, well, the, the Bible says otherwise. Uh, look at the Psalm 51. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Um, I have always been a sinner. And as a sinner, I can't be in heaven. I need forgiveness. Uh, John 3, when Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, he says, uh, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he's born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh. A sinful human gives birth to a sinful human, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. So, so if I was born of sinners, if I'm destined for death, well, that means I'm a sinner. That means that I need God's forgiveness. Um, so no, they're not innocent. I've Anyone here of the age of accountability? I've, I've heard of that a few times. I know a lot of people that say, oh, they're not 13, never 13. Okay. I'm responsible for their sins and children. And I'm like, what? Yeah, you know, that there's a lot of teachings out there about, about that, about the age of accountability. Um, I've had a lot of conversations with people. I've um, asked everyone, okay, where, where is that in the Bible? You know, because because if it's something I want to know about, and I've read the Bible a bunch of times, I haven't found it yet. Can you help me? Um, and most people are sure that it's in there somewhere. Um, I've asked eight pastors, pastors of, of other churches um, that, that teach the age of accountability. Uh, I, I've asked them, where is that in the Bible? And they say, all of them have told me it's in there. I'll find it and I'll get back to you. <laughs> Guess how many have gotten back to me? Zero. Um, the age of accountability is not in the Bible. Uh, and and I've, I've asked, what is the age of accountability? And I've heard 13, I've heard 16, I've heard 14, I've heard 12, I've heard 9, 8, 7. And I've heard, we don't know, but it's sometime where they're not responsible for their sins until then God holds them responsible for their sins. Uh, God doesn't say that. He says we were sinful from birth. He says sin demands punishment. And if I if I teach something else, um, that's dangerous because it leads people not to take seriously the need that even little ones have for forgiveness. Um, and, and I can understand wanting to do it. I, I totally get it. I, uh, boy, it was 
the church office was still in our lower level. It was a Saturday morning. I was uh, um, working down at the computer and uh, still wearing my pajamas. It was pretty early, I think like six in the morning, phone rings and, you know, surprising when the phone rings at six in the morning. And so I, I answer it. And there's this guy that we had been inviting for a while and he had, he had come to church maybe once or twice. Um, he wasn't a member. He hadn't, you know, been through Bible information class or anything, but um, I was the only pastor he knew. And so he called me and he said, Hey, Hey, can you get over here? Um, I, I really need you to come over. And I mean, it's one of those things where you can tell in his voice. Okay. The answer is yes. Yes. I'll, I'll go over there. And so I, I showed up and uh, um, there was an ambulance there and two paramedics carrying a, a stretcher out with a, a blanket over a, a very small body. Um, his daughter had been visiting and with, with her daughter, um, who was 18 months old, and, and that daughter died of SIDS during the night. Um, I mean, just, just a tragedy. Uh, and I had never met either, you know, his daughter or, or granddaughter, uh, but he, he brought me in to meet his daughter, and, you know, she was kind <clears> of <throat> curled up on the couch, just, just crying, and, and um, he introduced me to her, and the first thing she said was um, he was never baptized or she was, I, I never had her baptized. Um, and I totally get wanting to be able to say, oh, that's okay. All kids automatically go to heaven um, because you want to give comfort there. But it's not comfort if, if you don't speak the truth. I, I did go to the, to the funeral. Um, her husband, someone was, was a, a pastor and, and uh, he did the funeral. And um, when I went to it, he, he got up and he said, all kids automatically go to heaven. So, so she's good. It, it's all great. Um, but I couldn't say that because the Bible doesn't say that. And so I, I started talking to her and I asked her, well, you know, did, did your daughter know Jesus? Did you ever talk about that? Did you guys pray? And she said, yeah, we, we prayed every night and, and we always sang our songs before she goes to bed. And, you know, so, um, you know, last night I said, well, well, what songs do you sing? And she said, well, last night we sang Jesus loves me. This I know. I'm like, so you're telling me that, that the last thing you heard her say was Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible tells me. So yeah. Um, I'm like you realize she was confessing her faith. God was working in her heart. No one can say that uh, un unless the Holy Spirit is working there. Uh, and so I could give her comfort that, yeah, her daughter is with her, with her Savior. Um, but if I say, yeah, don't worry about it. All kids automatically go to heaven. That tells everybody, oh, it's not a big deal. It is a big deal. It's an amazing miracle that God worked through the word and, and gave that girl faith. Uh, not just, oh, no big deal. Um, so... False teaching is dangerous. Uh, and so when we talk about infant baptism, uh, we can't ignore what Scripture says. They need it. Um, you know, they're part of all nations. They're sinful. They need it. They can have faith. That's another argument that's sometimes made against it. Um, well, you know, little kids can't believe. And that one, I mean, you don't even have to go to God's Word. Um, you should. You should go to God's Word. But but even just, just looking at it... Um, if anyone has ever seen a mother and a newborn child, you cannot tell me that there's not a relationship there. That newborn child can't say the mom's name, might not know the mom's name, might not, you know, can't express anything. But no matter how hard I try to, to calm or comfort the, the kid, uh, but then as soon as you hand it to mom, all of a sudden, quiet, uh, there's a relationship there, right? That, that baby loves mom, has a relationship with mom. And that mom could be an awful mom, could be, you know, is definitely a sinner. Why would we say that, that a child can't have a relationship with the God who, who made it? Um, of course they can. They can have faith. But it's even better because the Bible says that very same thing. Um, in, in Luke 18, that's the story where uh, um, the, the people were bringing babies for Jesus to touch and bless. And, and the disciples were like, no, 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 he's too busy for that. You, know, you can understand that. Hey, he's, he's talking to the grownups now. Um, but Jesus says he was indignant at that. He called the children and said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. What's the kingdom of God? It's God's ruling in hearts, right? Um, so if they have the kingdom of God, 
That's saying they have faith. And he takes the next step. He says, I tell you the truth. Anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God, like a little child, will never enter it. H how does a little child believe? What, what's Jesus talking about here? What is he holding up as the example? Um, you know, I, I often wondered, I never did it, but I, I was tempted um, to teach one of my kids a couple of colors wrong. Like tell them every time I see yellow, hey, that, that's blue. And just to see how long that would last, you know, because dad said it, it must be. Um, I never did it, so I'm not that bad a person, but I, I was always, but, but they are just so trusting, right? I mean, you can, um, I, when, when my kids were little, especially Andrew, who is now 22, so it wouldn't go well now, but when I would get home, we had a split foyer. So you'd come in the front door and there were 10 steps up to the living room and, and his like play room was, was right over here. And he'd often be sitting in front of the, the TV with his Legos or whatever else. When he saw me coming in the front door, he would drop what he had. He'd get up and he would run across the living room and jump those 10 steps. Because this was a fun game we had started playing and he always wanted to play this game for a while. Um, I, I had to teach him, hey, you got to let me put down whatever I'm holding. Because one time it was pretty bad when I dropped everything to catch him. Um, but so... If any of you had walked in the door and I was sitting up on the couch in the living room, I was not going to run across the living room and jump. Why? Because I know all the things that can go wrong. Um, for him, it was just, it's dad. I trust him. I'm, I'm jumping. Uh, think about that as a picture of faith. God wants us to trust him like that, uh, to jump. If God says it, yeah, it's got to be good. Um, and he, he holds up kids. Yeah, they believe. The uh, Matthew 18 passage there is, is just there because he uses those specific words, those who believe in me. Um, he says they can have faith. And, and then you add to that the fact that throughout the history of the church, infants have been baptized. It, it is only um, recently, only in our area where, where it has become um, popular or, or you know, a, a more common thing for them not to be. Uh, but for 2,000 years, I mean, you look at some of the, the quotes there, you know, Origen, so in the second century, tells the practice of baptizing infants was handed down from the apostles. Uh, and it's one of those things that there's not a lot written about it because, well, of course, it's like, hey, I breathed today. You didn't need to hear that. You knew I breathed because you see me alive. Uh, for believers, yeah, of course, your, your kids were, were baptized. But when it is mentioned, it's always like this, you know, Irenaeus talking about uh, um, who through him are reborn into God, infants, little children, boys, young men. Augustine said he never heard of anyone who accepted the Bible as God's word, who rejected infant baptism. Uh, the inscriptions on the catacombs, you know, the, these tombs of, of uh, Aristus lived eight months. He was recently baptized. Um, you know, so it's, it's, uh, it's always been the practice. So for someone now to come and say, oh, that doesn't make sense. Let's change that. Um, you should have some concerns with that. Say, okay, show me from God's word why, where, when, how. Does that, does that make sense? Any questions there on infant baptism? All right. So. I guess I come from both sides of that. Okay. My, my father was Lutheran. Okay. My mother was raised in a Christian church. She was in that 12 to 13 year range. They were immersed. Mm -hmm. And uh, she became Lutheran when they were married. So okay. I guess I was baptized as an infant. So. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. But that was just you know, back in the early 50s, late 40s. Right. Yeah, it's only been the last couple when my mother was. Yeah, it's only been the last couple hundred years that uh, you know, really since the the awakening, you know, the Wesleys and and uh, the what do you call them, the the revivals, all of those that uh, that that became a more popular thought. Uh, although you know, in in worldwide Christianity, uh, it it's still just a speck. Um, where the majority of Christians uh, practice infant baptism. Um, but yeah, like I said, in this area, you come across a lot of people who say, no, 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 don't baptize the infants because they didn't 
do it. They didn't choose it. Um, but, you know, I, we gave all of our kids food uh, even before they could say food or milk or anything um, because we cared about them. And that's physical nourishment. How much more this, the relationship with God, the spiritual nourishment. So good. Uh, what does my baptism mean to me? Uh, God tells us we can take great comfort in it. You know, it assures me I'm clothed with the righteousness of Christ. We read that passage already. It assures me I've been washed clean of sin. In Ephesians 5, when he's talking about husbands and wives, he, he uses the picture of what God did for us to make us holy, cleansing us by the washing with water through the word. We're, we're cleansed. It motivates and empowers us to live a new life. Uh, Mary Beth, you want that one? Uh, Romans 6, 4. Uh, sure. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Okay, thank you. Um, we, we get a new life. Uh, like I said, it's not just a one-time thing. Hey, there was a, you know, the, the first Christian emperor, Constantine, there's a story that uh, he wanted to wait for his baptism until, because he, he came to faith later in life. And he decided he wanted to wait for his baptism until later so that he could cover all the sins that he would do, you know, after becoming a Christian. Um, most people who are waiting till the 11th hour die at 1030. You might have heard that, but uh, but that's not how baptism works. Baptism isn't just a, a one and done thing. Uh, it, it creates this ongoing relationship and gives us the comfort of our forgiveness because it connects us to the resurrection of Jesus and the work he did. To, to forgive us. Um, so we can go back to our baptism on a daily basis. Uh, Martin Luther talked about uh, every morning, uh, he, he would wake up and he'd make the sign of the cross. Um, so in other words, reminding himself of what Jesus did for him. And he would say three words, I am baptized. Uh, and then he was ready to face his day. I'm a child of God. I am, you know, uh, he was reminding himself of those promises that God made in baptism. And we can do the same. And you know, I, I find it interesting. Uh, what's what's the visible thing in baptism? It's water. We see water everywhere, right? I mean, our world is made of water. Uh, we have these reminders all over the place, so we can take that that comfort. Um, any questions you have on baptism? There's nowhere that says that you need to do it twice, though, right? <clears throat> okay. So, a uh, good question. Do you need to do it twice? Um, so let's let's think this through. In baptism, who does the promising? Who makes the promise in baptism? God does, right? Uh, he washes us. He clothes us. You know, so it's that arrow down thing. God is making promises to us. Um, if it were me making a promise to God, uh, you know how we are with promises. We, we try to keep them, but we sometimes break them. If it were me making a promise to God, I'd need to get baptized every day. But since it's God making a promise to me, um, he doesn't break his promises. It doesn't, you know, you don't need to, to do it again. You know, let's say uh, you're baptized as a little child and then, uh, you know, through high school and college, you get a little rebellious and you stop going to church and you, um, you become an atheist. But then something happens later in life and, and uh, you know, someone talks to you about their savior and, and you realize, wait a second, I've been, I've been missing this. Uh, and, and God brings you back to faith. Um, should you get rebaptized then? Uh, well, who made the promise in baptism? God did. Does his promise change? No. I might have stepped out of it, but now that he's brought me back, I've still got his promise. Uh, there are some churches that talk about rebaptizing. Like if you, um, if you join a Baptist church, for instance, um, they will say, well, you have to be baptized in our church to be to be a part of this church uh, and also if you weren't immersed before then you weren't even baptized so that doesn't count um, but baptism is not into a denomination or a church baptism is in the name of the father and the son and the holy spirit it's into a relationship with god uh, and, and no one denomination has a a corner on that uh, it's god's word that does it uh, so no you don't and usually that's because they're thinking baptism is an arrow up thing where baptism is my commitment to God. Um, but no, 
God tells us to make commitments to him, right? We, we use confirmation to do that. Right, where we stand up and we make our promises and say, uh, yep, I, I want to be in your word. I want to grow in your word. I believe. Um, and yeah, if I fall away and then come back, I should probably make those promises again. But God, God's promise stands. Um, so yeah, uh, do I need to be rebaptized? No. Um, in fact, I've had people say, hey, can I be rebaptized? You know, just to just to really give me that that comfort of knowing that that you know it's happened. Um, if you don't know that you were baptized, that's happened a couple times where someone says, I think I was probably baptized, but I've got no record of it and no one can remember it. Um, I've said, okay, well then let's baptize you. We're not going to re-baptize you. If you were baptized before that one took, you know, it's not like, uh, but because you don't know to give you the comfort to know that you were baptized, we'll, we'll baptize you. But if, if someone knows they've been baptized, um, I'll say, no, I'm, I'm not going to, because that would be pretending like God's promise didn't, didn't take, uh, mm -hmm. if, if the word was used, and if water was used, um, in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit, uh, you know, you're baptized into the triune God. You know, there's, there's questions like with, uh, well, what about in the Mormon church where they just baptize in the name of Jesus and they don't believe in the Trinity and, and all of that? Okay, well, then, then, you know, they didn't use that word or they redefined that word. So uh, just to be, to give you comfort, okay, let's baptize. But Again, where the word is used and water is used, that's a baptism. We don't need to rebaptize. Does that make sense? Any, any questions that brings up? Okay. Uh, then I've got some questions for you. And try not to look at the answers until after we talk about them a little bit. I put the answers in there just so that you guys would have the, the reference later. Uh, what happens to babies who die before baptism? Okay. Okay. So it's. Yeah, we don't know what they believed or or not. Um, yeah. So if if there was a baptism, we saw that, right? We saw the water. We heard the word. We know God keeps His promises, uh, so we know. If there wasn't a baptism, uh, again, we got to start by saying, whose call is this, right? It's God's. This is God. We know our God. He is a loving God. He loved that child so much that he killed his son so that that child could live. So we, we know our God, and then we're leaving it in his hands. But we can't say something that God doesn't say. We can't say, all kids automatically go to heaven, because that would be misleading. That would be going contrary to scripture. Um, so we... Uh, this is God's call, uh, and we rely on God's grace, who our God is. Uh, and we know that God can, you know, God can do whatever he wants. Um, can someone be saved without baptism? Absolutely. It's not the, the absence of baptism that condemns, it's the, the rejection of it. Or, you know, so Jesus told Nicodemus, if you're not baptized, you're not going to heaven. Um, and, well, Nicodemus was a part of a group that said, hey, we don't need your baptism. So, so for him, that was a rejection of God, you know, refusing that. Uh, think about the thief on the cross. Both other criminals are mocking Jesus uh, as, as he's dying. And then one of them realizes what, uh, what's going on. He realizes who Jesus is. He turns to Jesus and he says, remember me when you come into your kingdom uh, you know, he, he trusted and he, he realized Jesus was God's son um, and he was dying. And, and Jesus doesn't say, OK, let me quick baptize you. But he says, I tell you the truth today, you'll be with me in paradise. You know, it's faith. You know, you think about that passage. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. It doesn't say whoever is not baptized. Now, on the one side of it, whoever believes and is baptized, if I believe, I'm going to be baptized. And if I baptize, I'm going to believe. Um, you know, those two go together. But if, if, but the flip side, it's not, not baptized that are condemned, it's not believed. Um, so let's say uh, I meet a guy and, and tell him about Jesus and God works and, and he believes and, and we're talking about this and, and uh, we, he learns about baptism and he says, hey, I want to be baptized. Um, it's okay on Sunday, come on out to church and, and we'll baptize you and it'll be this wonderful thing. And God gives you all these gifts. And as on his way to church on Sunday, he gets in a car accident and dies. Um, where is he going? Olympic 
Kevin. Yeah, you know, if he believed, uh, absolutely. Um, it, it wasn't that he uh, was rejecting his faith by not being baptized. Uh, he was intending to be baptized. Um, but he believed, you know, that that's what makes the difference, faith or lack thereof. Um, so, yeah, so as far as the, the babies, you know, I, I always think of John the Baptist. Uh, we have that example of when he was in his mother's womb and he leapt for joy because he knew the, the uh, mother of his Savior had entered the room. Um, now, God sometimes does special, miraculous things, and that, that was certainly one of them. Um, but God also works through the word, you know, as, as uh, you know, was John hearing it through, through the womb? I don't know. Uh, but God had created faith in an unborn child um, because he can. Any questions there? I think children do have some type of faith. I mean, you even have people that haven't even been exposed to God that have some type of faith that they know that there's something larger out there. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and so, you know, you, you think about that, uh, okay, then what's the difference between an adult that says, I know there's something out there, but Jesus, no, that's not it, and and the child, you know, and, and you say, okay, this is too far beyond me, you know, this, this is a God call, um, and so, you know, the, the child, what what faith do they need? They, they need trust in Jesus as their Savior, right? Um, which isn't something that comes by nature. By nature, we understand, you know, lesson one, we understand there's something bigger. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, and, and, you know, one of the things is children, if they've been around the word and, and the Holy Spirit's working, you know, so it's, it's hard to say, uh, you know, some kids seem like they're really well behaved. Some kids, not so much. You say, okay, well, is that, I mean, that one, it's not about the activity, it's about the heart, right? And so when we try to judge that, well, we, we just have to go with what God says. Um, we know he loves them and it's his call. And those that we have any influence over, we're, we're gonna wanna share the word with, we're gonna wanna baptize so that we have that added, so we have that comfort that the tools that the spirit used are, are there. Um, does that make sense? Okay. Um, I guess we already hit that next question. Can an unbaptized person be saved? We, uh, we talked about that. Uh, what distinction do we make in baptizing adults? No distinction in form. Um, you know, it's water in the word. But normally we'll instruct adults first so that they understand what they're receiving so that they don't, you know, throw it out as soon as they, they receive it. Uh, whereas for the infants, you know, we baptize them and as they grow, we, we train them. Uh, any questions there? Uh, Rebaptism, you asked about. We talked about that. Uh, you know, it's once and for all. It's in the name of the triune God. It is effective. Who may baptize? How about that one? Who should do the baptizing? Okay. So, yeah, he gave it to his believers. So any believer can, can baptize. Normally, the pastor does the baptizing because the congregation has called the pastor to do that, right? You know, the, the Bible talks, you know, 1 Corinthians 4, um, Paul wrote, men ought to regard us as servants of Christ, those entrusted with those mysteries of God, those secret things of God. Um, 1 Corinthians 14, everything should be done in a fitting and orderly way. So when when it's the pastor that does the baptizing, there, there's better record keeping, there's the congregation is able to be brought into that so that there's the encouragement and support and prayers and and, and all of that but uh, in an emergency anyone can perform a baptism uh, you know my oldest son was not baptized by a pastor uh, he he was born early a uh, month early and he was about to go to the NICU and my wife was about to go into surgery and we said hey just in case anything happens let's baptize him so that we have that that comfort so, I mean it wasn't the water was in one of those little kidney shaped bowls and, uh, you know, a, a SEM student, I was a student at the time, you know, water in the word. Uh, my wife and one nurse as, as witness. Um, and that took. Uh, now, the first Sunday we were out of the hospital, we went to, to church and the pastor asked, hey, did you baptize? And I said, yep, we didn't re-baptize him or anything. 
but he just made it public and told the congregation so that the congregation could be praying and, and be all that support there too. So, uh, so we tried to um, cover that, that part of it as well. But, but yeah, anyone can perform a baptism. It's God's word um, that, that is making it powerful, his promise that's attached. Uh, and what uses our baptism daily? We talked about that, you know, the daily reminder and strength that our sins are forgiven. We're adopted into an ongoing relationship with Christ. Any questions? I think that's probably a good break point because then next week we can take sacrament and, um, well, actually, um, yeah, we'll, we'll get to the, the schedule later, but, uh, um, yeah, next time I teach, we can, we can do, uh, sacrament and, uh, yeah. Sound good? Questions, comments? Nope. All right. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for this time in your word, and thank you for the gift of baptism, the comfort and confidence we can have that you claimed us as your own. Help us take joy in, in the fact that we are baptized and, and be reminded of it often, and help us appreciate the gift that we have to, to give to those in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. And uh, don't forget, it's Holy Week, so Holy Thursday service, Thursday at 7.30. Uh, in person or on streams. Um, Good Friday service. If you haven't been to a Good Friday service, I really encourage you to do it. If you have been to a Good Friday service, you know you want to. So uh, we will see on Friday at 730, uh, that service of darkness, as we take some time to think about, you know, Jesus dying for our sins, and we'll, we'll have devotions on each of the, the seven words that he spoke uh, from the cross that night, that day. Um, and then, of course, Easter Sunday, sunrise service at 7 a.m., outside and then uh, 10 30 the festival service inside and then the easter egg hunt so bring your friends family everybody have a great night everybody you too thank you God's blessings